All right. Let's, uh, let's talk a little history. Uh, my name is Richard Campbell, and I uh, was actually born in New Zealand. But, uh, so I'm not too far away from home. Uh, granted, I left when I was three years old. I, live in, I was born, raised in British Columbia. This is my home on the left, my neighbor's home on the right. It's about six o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday, which is garbage day in my neighborhood. So this guy's not here by accident. He drops by every Wednesday to see if I put out my garbage cans early. Uh, most folks find this a bit disturbing, but uh, these are garbage eaters. You don't have to shake them out of your shoes. So they, they have their redeeming features and uh, fairly amusing. So uh, my, I have a small, that's about 100, 150 kilos worth of bear. I have a 10 kilo dog who trees them on a regular basis because he's part Klingon, like today's a good day to die, and he just goes for it. And the bear always has that moment where he's like, I could take him, not worth it, goes up the tree. So, and that's how terriers work. Uh, of course, I've left the summer of British Columbia to come to the winter of Sydney, although you guys do winter pretty well. And we're actually having a pretty rough summer. This is a sunrise right now. We've had a very big forest fire season this year, and the smoke is basically covering the city. So uh, it's uh, very orange right now and uh, not good air quality. It's almost uh, Los Angelesian. Uh, another thing that we don't have in British Columbia that I love are these things. These are awesome. <laughs> now, uh, I can think of a couple, I mean, other than the steering wheels on the wrong side, I think the ute is awesome. Although in the snow, this is probably a death trap. There's not a lot of weight over those rear tires there. I think you just go around and around and around. But you'd look good doing it. Uh, I wrote my first line of code in 1977. Now, that is not the most important thing that happened in 1977. The most important thing that happened in 1977 was Star Wars. Let's have our priorities straight. And I wrote that line of code on a TRS-80 Model 1. 4K RAM, cassette tape player, uh, it's 127 by 47 resolution. I believe that's a game of Star Trek being played at that moment on that machine. And uh, it had a version of BASIC on it, not written by Microsoft. This was a tiny BASIC, and it only had three error messages. What? <laughs> How? And sorry. <laughs> the most Canadian of error messages, really. <laughs> and kind of an honest, in fact, I love this error message, because it's honest. What is object not found, but sorry? <laughs> you know, the difference is back then it was all command line. You said print, divide one by zero. It goes, sorry. Today, today Windows makes you agree that you're wrong. Object not found, okay? There's no not okay button. I once had a neighbor come over and says, my computer says registry is corrupt, okay? I don't want to push that because I don't think it's okay. <laughs> but you don't have a choice, so sorry. Uh, obviously, uh, you've, you've run across me before. You know I, uh, I make a bunch of podcasts. I make conferences as well. If you care like, go, to go to the Northern Hemisphere, I'm doing one in Stockholm as part of the Core 2 launch uh, with Mads Torgensen and Scott Hunter and a bunch of other troublemakers. Uh, my big show will be in Vegas at the end of October. And that's where you'll see Mr. Guthrie and Mr. Hanselman and so forth. About 3,000 people come to that show. Uh, and I make a few podcasts. Any podcast listeners? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, I don't have to convince you anything, do I? Uh, it's Carl started .NET Rocks back in 2002, which is roughly three years before the word podcast actually existed, which is why we call it the Internet Audio Talk Show for .NET developers. That was the best name he could come up with. Uh, I came on board uh, as a co-host on episode 100, and we're at 1476 as of yesterday. I also make an IT-based podcast once a week, every Wednesday since April of 2007, so 545 of those. And although particularly relevant to this talk, there's the Tablet Show, which we started in 2011. Uh, I made 130 episodes on, and then I shall talk more about that when we get to that point in the story about the history of .NET. Uh, another thing that near and dear to my heart is Humanitarian Toolbox. We build open source software for disaster relief organizations. Uh, we did a codeathon this week here in, uh, in Sydney with a group of folks on Monday and Tuesday. I do codeathons to get people hooked on my projects. 
Um, one of the projects we're working on is called Already. It's now we're moving over to Core 2. I asked him to move over to Core 2 after he finished the Codathon because what could go wrong? Uh, but everybody got a pull request in over the couple of days that we were working, and I'm hoping to see more pull requests from them from, the, from there. We got about 150 people contributing to that project now, a little over 3,000 check-ins. All right, let's tell a story about Microsoft, and don't you love this logo? This is the original Microsoft from the very beginning of Microsoft when Bill quits Harvard, and he and Paul Allen get together in Albuquerque, and they write a version of BASIC. And that's actually a copy of it in the Computer Museum in, in, uh, in, in Northern California. And the, it's uh, written for the Altair. Now, and the reason this computer looks like this is this is before ROM existed. When you wanted to boot an Altair 18, 8800, you had to enter the boot instructions with the switches. There was about 115 of them. You had to set up the switches and load them to the accumulator. And that would start the tape reader to be able to run that tape to be able to have a version of BASIC to program on. And I think it's important in the context that Microsoft started out as a languages company, as a company for developers. But things happened along the way. Logos changed and focus changed. In the this is the 1980s Microsoft, and this is the era of DOS, right? Where IBM, because they've been declared a monopoly, in the computing industry, because of COBOL and the S360, they were completely dominant in the space, had a consent decree with the United States government that said they would outsource technology that was not central to their business. So when they were making a PC, which was a sort of a peripheral business, they outsourced the operating system. And that was PC-DOS. And one of the reasons Microsoft would grow to be what it was, was it became this operating system company. Now it's different. Things have changed. And if you fast forward into the 90s, the company's bigger, it's gone from DOS to Windows. We've had the great Windows 95 moment, and they're making many different development tools. And in 97, they hit an interesting point where they, they literally had too many different dev products. Now, the big dev products of the time were C++. First and foremost, Microsoft is a C++ company. Most of the developers program in C++. They make one of the definitive C++ compilers, even then and today. But they also had a very successful product for Windows called Visual Basic. And they had acquired FoxPro. And they were making more products, including J++, a version of Java for Windows, written by Anders Heilsberg. Anders Heilsberg had been recruited from Borland to write Java for the Windows stack, and he'd done a great job of it. So great, he'd scared the snot out of Sun Microsystems, and there would soon be a lawsuit. And then, of course, Visual Interdev. So, I don't have to talk about Visual Interdev anymore. I'm going to leave it right there. So Visual Studio 97 was the first attempt to bring all these products together because multiple IDEs cost a lot of money. Multiple runtimes cost a lot of money. Many different products going, all trying to do the same thing. So consolidation made a lot of sense. And they did not pull it off in Studio 97. In Studio 97, only two products, J++ and Interdev, use a common IDE. VB, C++, and FoxPro all have their own IDEs, which are separately installed. So not really a consolidated product at all. Uh, and of course, Microsoft being Microsoft at that time with J++, they start making extensions to Java to make it run more effectively in Windows. And this is where the root of that Sun lawsuit comes in. But we also have to remember that at this time, Windows on the desktop is utterly dominant. In excess of 90% of workstations are running Windows. And so Sun quite rightly is concerned that if Microsoft makes this great version of Java and extends it to only work on Windows to make it even more effective, that's pretty much going to be all that Java would ever be. And so they sue Microsoft and make them stop working on J++ to make it go away. And a year later, in 98, we get the first of the great renumberings in Studio 6. So instead of calling it 98, because it came out 98, oh no, they call it 6. This time, they've actually consolidated all the IDEs, but they've also renumbered all the products. So C++ is legitimately 6, and VB is legitimately 6. And the second version of Interdev is now called 6, but that's not going to help it. 
It's the third version of J++, which is actually called version two because they made a 1.1, and also the last version because of the sun suit. So that thing will go away. And another very important product in that box is the NT4 option pack. And I'll talk about why in a few moments because it's the beginning of new things. This is the end of the road of this particular development model, but it does do its main task of pulling all the IDEs together. Now, I've got to jump back a little bit and set some context. And I'm going to show you this Getty picture. This is from July of 1998. And don't these two look happy? And there's a good reason for that. They don't know what's about to happen to them. This is July of 98. In October of 98, things are going to change. And I'm still well ahead of .NET, but this is the beginning of the gestation of .NET. With Studio 6, at that moment, it was time to start rethinking things. And in parallel, there were other forces at work. And that's why I, I really like this picture because by the fall of 98, these guys will look a little different. Now you have to understand, jumping all the way back to June of 1995, Bill Gates is a master of the universe. This is the man that has achieved the unachievable goal of a PC on every desktop. And he is a hero, effectively, to the world. And then, Shortly after that previous photo was taken, in August of 98, he goes to the United States Senate and is deposed talking about anti-competitive practices. And you can find this video on YouTube if you care to watch it. Bill, being a master of the universe, is a bit dismissive of the senators, which in hindsight was quite unwise and they vilify him, right? This, now, there is a case to be had for the anti-competitive practices that Microsoft engaged in at the time. But the complaint came down really to this whole interaction between IE and Netscape and the fact that third-party software never seemed as well as run as well on Windows as the first-party stuff that Microsoft made. And because there was no way to see what was going on, they were accused of doing monopolistic practices of limiting other people's software. It turned out not to be true, but you can see the results in the Time Magazine cover that came after. So that cover is from November of 1999. And in fact, in January of 2000, or in, in November of 1999, Microsoft will be declared a monopoly and be ordered to break up into two companies, one that makes operating systems and one that makes everything else. And within a month, Bill will step down as CEO. And his friend Steve, who he's known for many, many years, will take over CEO. Bill will become chief architect. He's still chairman of the board, still heavily involved in the company, but now Steve's running the company. And I talked to a lot of software people who thought this was a mistake. And I can see that point of view, but the more I've studied this, the more I've realized this was the right guy at the time. It was Steve Ballmer that fought tooth and nail to keep Microsoft together and to develop this agreement with the US government that they called the consent decree. And part of that consent decree was that they would never exclude competitors from working with Windows in any way and that they would actually have a shared source version of Windows. Essentially, for people that wanted to build things on Windows, you could see the source code for Windows you couldn't compile it, but it was basically proof that they weren't doing anything inappropriate under the hood and to help you know how to interact more effectively with Windows. Now, this original agreement, which started in January of 2001, was supposed to last five years, and it would end up running for 10. And it is in the umbrella of this time, of this battle, that Microsoft is starting to develop .NET. And in the early stages, Steve Ballmer talked about it as next generation Windows services. Although shortly after that, you'll hear it called next generation web services, which is convenient because it's the same acronym. But if you really want to talk about Windows, or you really want to talk about .NET, there are three core groups that represent what became .NET, each solving a different problem. And I'm going to put a face to each of the groups, but I want you to understand there's hundreds, even thousands of people 
behind each of these faces. So let's start with the runtime problem. And a gentleman by the name of Jason Zander, who today is a VP, but back then was a PM, and was working on the problem of how to bring together the disparate runtimes. The Visual Basic runtime, guys, which in the end was a set of tools that wrote to Wind that worked with Windows, believe their runtime was the best. The C++ folks had MFC, again, a set of tools that worked against Windows that they thought was the right thing. And why make both? Why couldn't they make one? And I'm pretty sure each team was convinced that the other team should just use theirs and everything would be fine. And I think Jason was trying to find the center uh, line on that. He worked as part of the COM plus group, so they were trying to evolve COM at the same time, and he would ultimately own the problem of the runtime and the concept of managed memory as well. Second representative on the languages side, a gentleman by the name of Anders Heilsberg. And Anders, as we've already mentioned, came on board to implement Java for Microsoft, did a great job, then through political need was no longer able to work on Java anymore. And one would argue, if that hadn't happened, we'd probably all be Java programmers because what he did next was write a new language, one that we all pretty much know and love and has gone through many twists and turns along the way as well and became the father of C-sharp. He also built another tool in that same time called J-sharp, which was a bridge to allow J++ developers to move their code over to C-sharp relatively painlessly. Now, Anders puts developers first, and every time I've had an opportunity to interact with him, I see that mindset of how he takes care of folks that use his tools and what happens next to them. Third, and certainly not least, Scott Guthrie. Scott Guthrie joined Microsoft from Duke University as soon as he graduated. It's the only job he's ever had. And he went to work for a guy named Mark Anders on the NT Option Pack team that would ultimately ship with Studio 6. And inside of that NT option pack was IIS4 and active server pages. And Scott did not like active server pages. Now, Studio 98 or Studio 6 shipped at the end of November of 98. And it is as normal when a product team ships a product, they take a couple of weeks off before they get cranking on, the, on what happens next in the service packs and all the things that happen there. And because that was December, for the most part, the team took all of December off because it fell into Christmas. And Scott being a young man, freshly graduated from university only a few months before, and this is being his first project, he didn't really take the time off. What he did was work on something better than ASP, called an ASP Plus at the time. And over the course of December, he prototyped together a version of ASP Plus, his vision of better web development. And he showed it off in January when everybody came back to work and they loved it. And what it was, was a runtime environment that tied to IIS that allowed you to program in an object-oriented language to be able to draw web pages. And the language he programmed it with is Java. First version of ASP Plus ran against Java. It's what they had. C Sharp wouldn't exist for a couple more years. So at that particular point, it ran against Java. And so they showed it. They said, that's really cool. Stop using Java. <laughs> And they went on from there. And the name would change a few more times. ASP Plus would become ASPX, would eventually become ASPNet. Now, Microsoft had been shipping dev tools on a regular basis, almost a yearly cadence for many years. And operating systems, too. From 95 to 2000, there were OSs nonstop. And there were uh, PDC conferences on a regular basis. And in 2000, at the Orlando conference in July, which is a terrible time to be in Orlando, they announced .NET and kind of blinded people. They didn't see it coming. It had been two years since anything had shipped. And they'd gone through that battle with the DOJ. You know, Microsoft was kind of a dirty word at this particular moment in the, in the vernacular. Everybody was a bit anxious. Steve was now in charge of the company. Nobody really knew what was going on. And in the midst of all this, they talk about .NET. But they talk about it very much with an eye to the consent decree that won't be signed for almost another year. So one of the things they talked about was that they're going to have a new platform based on internet standards. That's why it's called .NET. And they're going to publish specifications for the CLR and for C Sharp, their ECMA standards, 334 and 335. Very strange thing for a commercial development company to say, hey, these cool new technologies that we're building, yeah, we're going to publish them out as, as ECMA specifications so that anybody can implement them, and some people will. 
At that same time, Windows 2000 comes out. And Windows 2000 is an important version of Windows because it consolidates the two lines. The NT line and the 9X line are going to come together into one version of Windows. This is also where Microsoft gives up on multi, uh, on different processors for Windows. Up until now in the NT line, you could also use an Alpha or a MIPS or a PowerPC chip. Now it's going to be only Intel. The first Pentiums appear at this time as well, and we break the one gigahertz barrier. So when people talk about the Wintel hegemon, logically it only starts now, where Windows is only running on Intel. Intel's got the Pentium. I mean, Weird Al Yankovic would make a song about the Pentium. And uh, we only have one version of Windows going forward. And it was a pretty good version of Windows. It's also the version of Windows where they actually decided TCPIP would be the primary networking protocol. Before that, there was NetBuoy and IPX, and, and TCP was just one of the players. So I bring up Windows in this case because in 2000, we made a lot of core decisions around what our platforms were going to look like going forward and the problems that that had. The following year at PDC 2001, well, actually, before October 2001, in July of 2001, at our O'Reilly conference, a 20-something Miguel Diacaza will announce that he is going to implement those ECMA specifications that Microsoft published last year as a Linux-based version. He will eventually call Mono, the Spanish word for monkey. Uh, also in 2001, IE6 will ship separately from XP. It'll come out a couple of months before then. And that's a problem because it comes out actually ahead of the CSS1 standard being ratified. So it's an odd version of CSS. So in October of 2001, we get, we have IE6, we have Windows XP, and we get the release candidates of the .NET framework and what they're calling Studio.NET, which by the way, alongside XP was bundled with a tablet edition with pen support, a tool called Passport for universal sign-on, and a set of tools called My Services, codenamed Hailstorm, that would allow you to have integrated services served up by central servers, very cloud-like in 2001. These two things would not go well. And part of it, I think, has a lot to do with that consent decree, which will be signed in November of 2001 and set the stage for certain conditions that Microsoft's going to operate in going forward from there. So a lot of great ideas that came out of PDC 2001, just not all of them went particularly well. And I have nothing bad to say about XP. Well, at the time I did, because I liked Windows 2000. I called XP Windows 2000 with the Fisher-Price interface, because it had all the nice, rounded, colorful buttons and things. It was a very good-looking, very cute version of XP. It also didn't support USB. That would come later. Our memories of XP are sort of twisted by how long XP was our operating system, and it went through so many twists and turns. But another major event that happened in this time frame was the explosion in malware. So in February 2001 was when the Anna Kornikova virus went for a ride. In July, the Code Red Worm. In August, Code Red Worm 2. In September, the Nimda Worm. It was just nonstop breaches and attacks, one after the next, so that by January of 2002, Bill Gates puts out one of his famous letters. The same way back in 95, he put out the Internet Tidal Wave letter that got Microsoft focused on Internet technology. In 2002, he puts out the Trustworthy Computing Letter. And what it really says under the hood, everybody needs to focus on security. It's time to fix this once and for all. And he'll do it. It's not a small task, it's gonna take years, but you know, really, we've never had that level of exploit since. Now in the context of XP, XP had just shipped when this letter comes out. XP Service Pack 1 is already in the works. It's all the stuff that got pushed out from the initial deployment, and it's bug fixes. So the security version is gonna be XP Service Pack 2. And they put a special team together that's focused on that security problem. And it effectively splits the Windows team. They have all those best and brightest solving the security problem while they're, while, uh, to deal with SP, uh, XP2 uh, and continue on. And there's a real interesting debate to have around whether it should have been Service Pack 2 or not. And so by February of 2002, shortly after the letter, we get the first version of Visual Studio.net and the first full version of .NET. So that's the first version of C-sharp, uh, which is really the, 
The first time Microsoft made a fully object-oriented language. I mean, C++ you can argue about, but from scratch, a brand new language, it was kind of a big deal for Microsoft as much as it was for all of us. The marketing campaign around Studio.net was awesome. It was 22 languages, one platform. It was kind of the opposite of the way Java was presented, right? Because Java was presented as any platform, one language. And I was trying to think of 22 languages, that they actually had 22 languages in the box, because that's a lot. I mean, the obvious ones are there, C Sharp, C++, VB, J Sharp, but then less obvious ones like Component Pascal, Fortran, Eiffel, Haskell, Mercury, Oberon, Oz, Perl, Python, RPG, Scheme, Smalltalk, Standard ML, and of course, Fortran, or no, COBOL. Don't forget Bobal. All .NET versions, many of them don't particularly go anywhere. Uh, Fox Pro leaves the box at this point and goes on its merry way. We'll put out a couple of versions on its own because it's not a .NET language and never will be. In this same time frame, in March of 2002, Microsoft releases the Rotor Project. And the Rotor Project is a academic shared source version of .NET, so the CLR, C Sharp, base class libraries, all of that stuff is put out in an academic license. So you can't really use it for a product, but the source was published, so that was available as well. Call it pseudo open source. But Microsoft does open sourcey things several times around the .NET space. And a year later, we get 1.1, version two, really. This is all the bug fixes for both the framework and the CLR, some new features into the language. We start stratifying the versions, so we get a professional version, and we get an architect's version, which makes you wonder, are architects professionals? Uh, be that as it may. Talk about PDC 2003. So in 2000 and 2001, they put a lot of energy into talking about .NET before .NET was released. And I think it got the PDCs on a bandwagon now of talking about future, future stuff. At the same time, Microsoft has an image problem. This battle with the DOJ has sort of shaken their confidence, certainly shaken their customers' confidence, and they start to be a little more publicly visible. A guy named Robert Scoble joins the company and creates Channel 9, named after United Airways' ability for you to listen in on the pilots from Channel 9. That's where the name comes from. And he runs around with a video camera inside of Microsoft, putting human faces on the product so that people can sort of see what's going on. And I think that's what sets the tone for PDC 2003, because at PDC 2003, we start talking about the new version of Windows. Now, there was more than one new version of Windows, because Microsoft had a problem. They'd been so successful with Windows, it was kind of dominant in the market. They could do whatever they wanted, pretty much. And so they had come up with some wild ideas. The, 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 the XP version of Windows, the code name was Whistler. Whistler named after a mountain not far from where I live. And so the next version was going to be named Blackcomb, which is literally the next mountain over. And it was object-oriented everything. They were going to do this awesome object-oriented operating system that nobody could get their head around, so they dialed it back. And right between the mountains of Whistler and Blackcomb, there's a bar called the Longhorn Bar. So they named the dialed back version Longhorn. That's where the name comes from. And at the PDC 2003, they talked about Windows Longhorn, built on the three pillars, Avalon, Indigo, and WinFS. Avalon is a completely object-oriented way to render to the screen. Now, under the hood, this was a very important thing because we wanted to be able to use the GPU inside of Windows. We'd just been bit blinting inside of Windows up till now, just using the video card as if it was memory. And so you had DirectX whenever you wanted to play a game that would actually use a GPU properly. They wanted to incorporate that into the OS as a whole, and Avalon was their way forward on that. And Indigo was the tooling for communications between processes, between machines, across the internet, any protocol, any packaging, any way. That was the intent of Indigo. And WinFS, one of the callbacks to the Black Home project was completely object-oriented file system so that a file is now an object and executing it like opening it in Word is effectively a method. It was ambitious, let us say. And they had a tough time getting it done. They had a lot to build there. And remember, their team was split in half because they were working on SP2. And SP2 dropped 
in August of 2004. Now, I would argue that Microsoft probably should have called this Windows XP version 2, because calling it that would have reset the clock. See, buried inside of every enterprise agreement when you buy a Microsoft product is this guarantee, because you don't buy individual products per se. When you're a big corporation, they count up the number of users, give you a price per user, and you get everything. And inside that contract, it says you get a new OS every five years, no matter what. And so XP was shipped in November of 2001. Five years is November of 2006. And it is now August of 2004, and Windows has a long way to go. And the guy running XP SP2 is a guy named Jim Alchin. Now he's finished, he takes over the Windows project, and he, start, he kicks out the three pillars to get focused on building a version of Windows that's gonna make that deadline. Now that, we know, is gonna turn into a crisis. In the meantime, over in the .NET world, we have one of the very best versions of .NET com coming out. This is November of 2005. This is the third version of .NET called version two. Because numbering is fun. So this is CLR2, Framework2. Uh, one of the reasons CLR2 was so good is that the SQL Server 2005 guys wanted the version of .NET that would run inside of SQL Server. Now, this isn't a good idea, but it was useful for certain classes of customers that Microsoft had. The folks that were doing big data before big data was a thing had these huge computational requirements across massive amounts of data that were storing in SQL Server, and T-SQL wasn't cutting it. So they wanted a lightweight version of .NET that they could run inside of SQL Server to do this hard computation. Like I said, it's still not a good idea, and if you want to mess up your SQL Server, turning this feature on, because it's off by default, is a good way to do that. Now you can embed a web request into a where statement or into a group by statement and have it happen every iteration. That's a long running query. But the side effect of SQL 2005's need was a much tighter version of the CLR. It benefited the CLR. Every time you could take something out of its context and press again it, you get a stronger version. Another thing that came out in 2005 was 64-bit support. So AMD came up with the original extensions the, uh, the AMD 64 extensions that allowed us to run 64-bit. Intel had been building a whole new processor called Itanium that both guys that bought it really loved. <laughs> and Microsoft was gonna be able to program against it, but when AMD came up with these extensions, Intel realized that was a better way. They came up with their Intel extensions and boom, we had 64-bit everywhere. This is also when we get generics and partial types for C-sharp, a very good version of .NET. In 2006, we get the first Mix conference. And this is where Microsoft really starts exploring against the open web world and connecting with folks here. This is when they finally put out a new version of IE. IE 7 comes out in October of 2006. And people say, why five years? Why did it take five years to go from IE 6 to IE 7? And uh, there's a good reason. The team behind the rendering engine for the browser was the team behind WPF, behind Avalon. They were busy. And so it took them a while to get to the new version of IE. Uh, and IE 6 gets to eventually start going away at this point, eventually. And of course, in November of 2006, we get Vista and all of the problems therein. And a long, I mean, it's interesting to think about. In November of 2006, right on that five-year deadline, they shipped the Enterprise Edition of Vista. No other versions. Only the Enterprise Edition. Only for enterprises to comply with the volume license agreement requirements because they know no enterprise company is going to install it because enterprises only install after the first service pack. That's how enterprises work. And we, as regular consumers, we're gonna get the normal versions the following year, in March of 2007, with all the stuff that's broken fixed. The only people who installed that version? Reviewers, because that's their job. And so they reviewed a very, very troubled version of the operating system, and I had my mother call me and say, I don't want Windows Vista. And I said, you're not qualified for an opinion. <laughs> because she wasn't, but I didn't install it on her anyway. And of course, the, sh the breakup of Longhorn put Avalon and Indigo and all those bits onto the .NET team. So they suddenly have to produce a special version of .NET, the 3.0 version, that incorporates what we become Windows Presentation Foundation, Windows Communication Foundation, Windows Workflow, and Card Space. These are all bits that ultimately were supposed to be part of Vista, and now we had to have a programming model against them very quickly. Uh, interesting to also note, this is when Intel ships Core 2, 
not the core two we know and love from .NET, but core two, the dual core processor, and every processor after that will be multi-core. So we're multi-core as of July 2006 and thereafter. And I couldn't, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this little bugger in June of 2007. So while Microsoft's dealing with the Vista problems and trying to straighten out .NET from receiving all of that code, iPhone comes out. And you know, the sad part is it was kind of the end of the phone at this moment. Because before this phone, phones were kind of cool. They had keyboards, some were slide out, some were upright, some had antennas. There was all kinds of things that happened with phone. But after iPhone, they're all slabs of flat glass. It's boring, but that's what happens. And so out comes the phone. And at the same time, Microsoft comes up with a really interesting tool. Now the first, ver uh, it was originally, the code name was WPF slash E for Windows Presentation Foundation slash Extensions. And Brad Abrams, who was running the team at the time, we did an interview with him on .NET Rock, said, I've learned something. If you give a product a cool code name, you get a bad product name. Avalon becomes Windows Presentation Foundation. But if you give the product code name, make it a bad code name like WPFE, you get a cool product name, Silverlight. Now the first version of Silverlight, you program it in JavaScript, right? XAML barely exists at this particular point, but they have a runtime for the Mac. It's really about media play. And one of the things they do with Silverlight, it's important inside of Microsoft as a whole, is they start iterating it independent of the rest of the products. This is one of the first things you can download separately from Microsoft, and they put out a bunch of versions very quickly. And in this same time frame, this is in 2007, Scott Guthrie starts hiring his ninja army. He hired Scott Hanselman, Rob Connery, and Phil Hack in the same month. That's a lot of open source guys all at once. Also in October of 2007 is when he first shows off MVC at the alt.net conference in Austin and blows everybody's mind with, you know, it is not just about web forms, but it's the beginning of all of those things is in 2007, well before most people were thinking about it. By November of 2007, we get .NET, 3.5 and Studio 2008. So now J Sharp goes away. We've integrated all those WPF products. This is the beginning of the designer movement. So you're supposed to have a designer working with you as a developer to handle the WPF things. They put out Expression Blend. We interviewed like the three teams that actually had a designer dev working together at .NET Rocks. Most people just faked it or used WinForms and were happy. And Silverlight continued to iterate through many versions. In 2008, a lot happens. This is where we get Silverlight 2, and we start seeing uh, a lot more capability in terms of actually being able to deploy to the Mac, and it becomes a really good deployment vehicle. The first version of Chrome comes out in September of 2008, uh, and Bill Gates has now stepped down. He's gone off to do his uh, curing of malaria and the Bill and Melinda Foundation. The amazing Miguel Diacaza puts out Moonlight, a open source Linux version of Silverlight that's got a lot of, uh, of the similar bits in it. And at the uh, PDC in 08, we hear the first words about Azure from a guy named Ray Ozzie. He's taken over as chief architect and he talks about the story about how Microsoft has so many different platforms that they use, right? The MSDN side, the MSN side, all these different huge suites that they all have separate hardware and doesn't it make sense for us to have a consistent framework for all of them run together? Hey, you can run it too. All you have to do is live in a web role and an app role. Uh, I think Ray Ozzie had a tough time being at Microsoft. The guy built great products over the year. This is one of the guys behind Lotus Notes. He built Groove, which Microsoft acquired. Very, I think it was a mistake to call, to take the title chief architect because Bill had it. And you're never going to be Bill. That's okay, you should be Ray. And he was very, a very smart man, but very challenging to take this on. But he wrote a letter that really defined the concept of cloud inside of Microsoft that became Azure. So. He served well. Uh, it's just a very, very tough role to jump into. The cleanup of Windows finally takes place with Windows 7, a beloved version of Windows led by a guy by the name of Steven Sanofsky. 
uh, and definitely gets Windows back on the track in a way that folks are much happier with. It's now 2009. And Windows Azure shipped shortly after that in February of 2010. In some respects, Microsoft has its feet under it now. We have Azure, it can run SQL Azure, it can do PHP, .NET, and Java on it. So this, this is the beginning of a cloud environment. AWS is a couple of years ahead. We have a good version of Windows, and Silverlight's maturing nicely, so we're actually able to play with all these environments. And then, in March of 2010, the big iPhone comes along. <laughs> and it's not so much that this device comes out per se, but a month later, in April of 2010, Steve Jobs will put out a letter via the Wall Street Journal called Thoughts on Flash. Now, what Steve had actually learned is if you ran Flash on this thing, it wiped the battery out in a few hours because Flash is evil. But his answer was no plugins are gonna run in Safari on iOS devices anymore, which effectively lynches Silverlight by proxy on the iPad and ultimately on the iPhone as well. Flash will give in. By the end of this year, they'll say, we're not gonna make Flash for mobile browsers anymore. So they weren't wrong. If Flash hadn't been as bad as it was, they may not have had to go here. There are then be third party tools you can install on the iPad so you can still run Flash, so you can drain your battery in a couple hours if you want to. But you know, that's what Steve was trying to protect us against and it just had a big impact on the product as a whole. This is also roughly the time WinPhone 7 comes out and while I loved it, apparently it was only me. Uh, Studio 2010. Another great version of Studio, because this is when we finally rev everything. So we get a new version of the framework, we get a new version of the CLR, we get parallel extensions, we get Silverlight 4, it now works with Chrome, it goes fully out of the browser, we start seeing some really cool stuff being done with Silverlight, like the 2010 Olympics. Uh, also, things that are amazing in Studio 2010 that we may have forgotten about. This is of the first version of Studio shipped with an open source library, jQuery's in the box. And Microsoft will support jQuery to the point where they'll create the jQuery foundation that today is the JavaScript foundation. So while we could still look at Microsoft as anti-open source, kinda, in 2010 we start seeing them making serious moves towards open source in a big way. But that is April of 2010. By October of 2010 at the last PDC, things are getting a little tougher. This is at the Redmond campus, only about 1,000 people be there. It was all streamed so that everyone could see it in action. And somebody notices, and that somebody is a lady by the name of Mary Jo Foley, but a lot of us noticed that we just went to a professional developers conference and they didn't talk about Silverlight at all. And so Mary Jo interviews the VP of server and tools, a guy named Bob Muglia, and asks him, why aren't you talking about Silverlight at the professional developers conference? And Bob Muglia said, our strategy has changed. That's all really he said. Other people grabbed that and said, Silverlight is dead, like it burst into flames or something. But the reality, of course, is goes back to the spring with the fact that the iPad and iOS was not gonna run Silverlight. And so if you really had to be across all of those platforms, Silverlight wasn't gonna do it for all of them. It would do it for the Mac, it would do it for Windows, but it wouldn't do it for everywhere. Silverlight continues to ship. Five will come out in December of, of 2011, but we are up against that particular issue and it creates a crisis. Bob Muglia leaves the company by the end of the year, giving up a VP role. And the guy who will take over his job is named Satya Nadella. Now, in that same time frame, in the March 2009 time frame, we had an interesting dynamic going on between the major browsers. IE9 is going through its beta revs very rapidly. Chrome is updating constantly, and Firefox is updating constantly, and they're making JavaScript better. There's no other way to describe it. JavaScript got dramatically faster over the late 2010 through 2011 into early 2012. Many, many iterations over and over again. The Chakra engine in IE, the V8 engine inside of, of Chrome, and the uh, uh, JavaScript Nitro engine inside of Fox. These were all ways to, for us to lean out and make JavaScript smarter that led to tools like Node. Node only made sense when the V8 engine was as fast and as efficient as it was. He's like, hey, let's, you know, JavaScript doesn't suck near as much when you get the browser DOM out of the equation. Let's go write JavaScript by itself. And that's, you know, what Node became. 
So JavaScript's having a really good time, the same time that .NET is struggling over this fragmentation that affects Silverlight. And in 2011, we have the first build conference. So this is where Windows 8 and Server 2012 and Studio 2012 are announced, but also WinJS. JavaScript for Windows, a set of extensions to allow JavaScript developers to interact with Windows, which was an interesting statement to make at that point, that we're gonna let JavaScript go everywhere inside of the Windows space, because JavaScript was pretty strong. And so you have to wonder where IE was. I went to this show. I make a podcast called .NET Rocks. And we walked out of the show having not talked about .NET at all, and Carl and I kind of looked at each other and what if .NET doesn't rock? So we made a new show. That's where the tablet show came from. We lit that show up as a hedge, just in case JavaScript was really going to rule the world. We're going to have to do, and that show would focus on cross-platform development, iOS and Android. We'd do all those things. Now, we eventually would roll it back into .NET rocks. So that's why it went away. But at this particular moment, it's a hard question. But there's another player. Microsoft may not have been focused on .NET at this particular moment. They were pretty focused on the tablet problem and JavaScript problem and so forth. But there was this guy, and it was Miguel Diacaza, who had been building Mono for many years, and he started building mobile tools around it a couple of years before. Mobile, uh, Mono Touch, or, which was really Mono for iOS, and in 2011, at the same time that this was going on, he put out Mono for Android. Also, uh, Novell runs out of money and gets acquired by Attachmate. An attachment says, we don't care about mono anymore. You people can all go home. And Miguel with his friend Nat Friedman get together, form a new company, and pull the rights out of attachment for all the mono stuff. And the new company we know as, as Xamarin. So if you think about it, at this dark moment on the Microsoft side for the .NET world, this team was putting C Sharp front and center for iOS and Android, showing there's more than one way to do this. We have solutions here. And so we have Studio 2012 uh, get developed. It supports the ARM processors, is the whole WinRT line. Again, showing a strength of Studio and the .NET library as a whole that we can switch platforms pretty much on demand. Most people remember the 2012 version as the version where your menus went all caps, and that's what everybody cared about. But also Microsoft lit up a team called Microsoft OpenTech, actually a separate entity, and its job was to make sure that all open source libraries worked well with .NET stuff. So while on one hand you could say we were having a tough time for .NET, there were very positive open source movements going on inside of Microsoft related to this. And so when we get to build 2012, where Win8 actually ships and WinJS comes out at version one, the interceding year, most of the apps that were available at this build in the App Store for Windows 8, written in C Sharp and XAML. Hint. .NET's not dead. Actually, .NET's just doing fine, with or without you. In 2013, we got the very important version of Studio for two reasons. One is no longer all caps menus. Second is you can buy the box, but there are no disks in it. It says, go to the internet. Are you a crazy? Just download it. Uh, and NBC is at version five, mature, running well. And we, we uh, get another big hint when they rename Azure from Windows Azure to Microsoft Azure. Because the other aspect you have to look at if we're solving this problem of how do we do cross-platform and development, right? which this is what propagates this going all the way back to 2010. The crisis was around running on all the platforms that matter. You could do it in JavaScript or you could just make .NET cross-platform. What you had to do was change the core mantra of .NET. .NET used to be all these languages, one platform. What if it wasn't one platform anymore? So one would argue that .NET helped drive the idea this is not a Windows-centric company anymore. And this is when Steve Ballmer steps down, Satya Nadella becomes CEO. Bill Gates comes back. It wasn't largely advertised, but part of Satya's deal was that Bill does half time at Microsoft. He's reviewing all the products again, and he does a good job of that. He's not the face of Microsoft, but in a lot of ways, he's dad. And dad will only let one particular product do a particular thing. We won't have three doing the same thing anymore. And so with the Microsoft Azure, Satya in charge, we have 
the April build, April 2014 build. The .NET Foundation, Microsoft now supporting an open source foundation. Xamarin's in it, identity servers in it. A lot of sessions you've seen here represent products that become part of the .NET Foundation. Roslyn, the open source version of C Sharp, didn't start out as open source, it was just C Sharp written with C Sharp, but it becomes open source. Oh, and cross-platform. We can make it run on Mac and Linux as well. And my, Microsoft also announces that any device with a nine inch screen or smaller, Windows is free. That's kind of crazy when you think a couple of years before, pretty much everything Microsoft did made money from Windows. That was what they drove on. All of their billion dollar businesses were Windows businesses. I mean, it's not just Windows and Windows Server, but it was also Office and System Center and SQL Server and Exchange Server and Dynamics. All of those products depended on Windows. And here they were giving away Windows for free if the screen size was small enough. And if you run a run system center on a nine inch screen, more power to you. And this is the point actually where HTML5 gets ratified. So we I mean, we're all of these parts were moving at the same time. And we get to 2015 with, I would say my current version of favorite version of Visual Studio, 2015 edition. This is when Win 10 comes along. We get the edge browser. Let's leave that alone. Uh, MS OpenTech, which they started a couple of years before to make sure that all .NET stuff worked well with, with open source libraries, it actually gets rolled back into Microsoft. They didn't need to make it a separate entity because they're open source focused now. And we also get Visual Studio Code, right? Built on the Electron Edge. It's like Microsoft's now building cool, powerful open source software. So suddenly we are an open source company. We've managed to get away from being completely focused on Windows. We don't care about the platform, we care about you doing development. And obviously the cloud has an important role in all of this. And in the background, they rewrite .NET. This is .NET Core. Not a small effort to actually essentially rewrite it. And bumpy, it's not easy to rewrite stuff that's 15 years old, people they didn't, they, they had to relearn a lot of different things. So by June of 2016, we get the first version of .NET Core, by March this year, we got 1.1. And this week, we got two. And the same way I feel about the old .NET Framework 2 in 2005, I'm starting to feel about Core 2. I mean, it's early days yet, but we're finally getting mature enough now that we start to think in terms of the plumbing's all there, the bits are all there. This is a great way to build software. So you have to question what comes next in this path. I've raced along through a long story of 20 years or so, but I hope you get a sense that we've gone through a bunch of waves and we're kind of at a high point right now. The core, the existing framework, 4.71, soon we'll have a 4.72, is never been better, right? Windows works well against it, it's easy to develop against, and core is starting to mature. The third version, number two, as usual, uh, <laughs> finally has a feature set complete enough that we can explore it. It makes me wonder how many projects I should be able to open up in 4.7, switch over to 2 and recompile and start to look at a cross-platform world. But I think it's a challenge for us who've been in this, world, in this place for a long time to actually think in terms of, can you think about the, this company as a development company? That developers come first, development tools come first, Operating systems come second. We hope you'll run your stuff on the cloud, otherwise we're not gonna be able to stay in business. <laughs> good news is there's a lot of good stuff going on inside of the cloud. But that's what I see is coming next, is they, if we're a development-centric company, and I don't work for the company, but if we are actually development-centric, then their message, their goal, their motion is about making developers more productive. The more stuff we can build for people, deliver for people, be effective for people, the more they can use the platform that we provide them in that rebirth of Hailstorm that they're now calling Azure, the more results we can deliver for our customers, the more successful they'll all be. That's where I think our history is right now, and I hope it's gonna keep coming true. Thanks for coming.